how do you go about doing this? Do we design something to give to them that could be used? The organization started in 1998. We started as a group of mothers who were really passionate about the fact that our children became sick quite innocently. Is it unreasonable to put this at the top of the list of things to rule out? It's one of the fastest infectious diseases in the United States. We were very concerned that our backyards weren't safe anymore. And, and not only were our children in, in danger, so many others were, and that they had no idea. Many of the children uh, were suffering with something that we did not understand. It was, and, they, and many of them went undiagnosed for a long time until we recognized that they were indeed suffering with Lyme and tick-borne diseases. And it was almost like an SOS call out to our Department of Health and our school educators saying, help us tell people what's in the backyard. And we put on our first educational seminar at Central Middle School in Greenwich, Connecticut, and over 300 people came out. We started off as a Greenwich Lyme Disease Task Force because in Greenwich, these are our roots, but we realized soon thereafter that the organization was not just Greenwich. And because we felt it was really time for Lyme, we decided that it was time to adopt that as the main name of the organization, and so we did a name change. Well, over the years, the organization evolved into a research organization. It was obvious that the name of the organization no longer reflected the work we were doing. But as we move into a larger arena and want to be more of a presence in the, in the country as well as in the region, uh, we need a name that, uh, that says who we are and says what we do very clearly. So once we honed in on the mission statement, we realized that the name Lyme Research Alliance was actually the perfect name. It reflected our organization perfectly. So the Time for Lyme organization has become Lyme Research Alliance. In the early days, it was imp important to get credibility and good science behind this disease. So to open the first endowed center for the study of chronic Lyme in the world under the direction of Dr. Brian Fallon was a huge moment for us and a huge moment for the disease. By having this center at such an established in institution, it offered great credibility to the illness, and that's helped with bring on researchers, it's helped bring on government officials, and it's helped continue to bring in more donors. The greatest damage caused by this disease is ignorance. But there were many other researchers out there doing work, and we felt we had an obligation to review that further. We knew we needed the best and the brightest on this problem, and we needed it right away. People who have a successful track record, who are doing fact-based, unbiased, scientifically sound research. And we began to fund other researchers at major institutions around the country. A team at Texas A&M, headed by Karen Newell Rogers, is very close to getting FDA approval for the first ever drug to treat chronic Lyme disease. We take our grant making very seriously. It's the primary thing that we do. But our grant review process is modeled on that of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. Um, we have a team of, uh, of researchers who review our grants, help us to review our grants. And we have uh, powerhouses, experts in the field of Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. And after that, the financial part of the Scientific Review Board will be looked at very closely to make sure their budgets are the best they can be. It's very thoughtful. It's a very transparent process. If you have long-term Lyme disease, um, it's a life-altering, long-term, serious health and financial problem. You know, I'd like to say we're very strategic on how we approach things. We have a research agenda, and then on the top of that agenda is an accurate diagnostic test. The tests for Lyme disease have always been notorious for their lack of specificity. Very often a patient would come into their doctor's office, the doctor relied on the serological test and the test was negative. That did not mean that the patient did not have Lyme disease. The reason why these tests had such poor sensitivity was that they used the technology that was available uh, decades ago. And what we now have available is a whole new revolution in technology. We identified the genetic code for the whole family of organisms that cause Lyme disease. It was an enormous effort. Millions and millions of bases of nucleotides had to be sequenced. And from that, 
we were able to identify 500 key proteins that were specific to the Lyme disease organism that are not found in any other organism. And if someone has a positive test to that specific protein, we know that they have Lyme disease. Can you imagine if everybody who has Lyme disease can be diagnosed? How it would revolutionize the ability to decrease the number of patients that go on to the late manifestations of Lyme disease, which can be so devastating. We have to make the accessibility of testing easy and cheap. At this point, what we're doing, it's only done in a research laboratory. But the next step is going to be whether that other part of America, not the research part of America, but the part that brings things or ideas from the laboratory to the marketplace, whether they're going to play a role. The Lyme Research Alliance plays a critical role in Lyme disease research. They want to see what is the idea that's going to be the spark. They're looking at for creativity, they're looking for innovation, they're looking at good questions and they have a good chance of bringing the big prize. We are very hopeful about the promising research that's taking place right now. And it's because we, we fund the best people in the business basically. What started out as a group of moms who were concerned about the health of their children has now evolved into a leading organization in the field of Lyme and tick-borne disease research. If it weren't for the research dollars that we are able to obtain in the private sector, a lot of this cutting edge, innovative, groundbreaking research would not come to bear. We could never have done this alone, any of us, but as a team, we have built a tremendous organization of people that have come together to make this happen. We have been waiting for years with the hope of this type of technology to be applied to this disease process. And we're there. We're right on the cusp of this now. But we're gonna need a lot of support. We're gonna need a lot of attention, a lot of focus. The generosity of the donors have brought us so far. Now it's time to bring it home.